couple people come in. Hi, everybody. We are live. We have to wait for people to show up. Hi. Yeah. Oh, okay. We are live with Dr. Bacheva Maslow, and we're going to wait like just, I know we said 745, but hi, everybody. We're going to wait just a couple minutes for, um, wow, uh, a couple of people to show up. This is going to be, hey, everybody, this is going to be a really um, interesting, informative live. I haven't done a lot. I don't think I show people's faces on. So this is like, this is like really exciting. Do you want some red lipstick? Represent. Represent. Hi, everybody. in my real life at the end of exactly. the day. Exactly. That's right. That's right. I got my hair up in a messy bun. I don't even have shoes on. So, you know, we got the fire crackling. She hyped me up on caffeine. Yes. Hi from Vegas. Okay. Hi, everybody. Oh, in Vegas, it's not even nighttime yet. Right. Exactly. <laughs> um, all right. So we're going to start. We have about 200 people here watching. Wow. So, yes. And, oh, actually, let's, let's, um, let's tag um, egg freezing. Um, what should we call it? Egg freezing with... Dr. M A S L O W. Hello, M A S L O W. Yeah. Hey from Miami. Hey everybody. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask Dr. Masla. Hold on. If I know how to pin something, that would be nice. Just a second. Oh, hold on, everybody. One minute. One second. It's really as nice in real life as it is in in, uh, on the camera. Oh, yeah. Okay, pin comment. Okay. We, not we, I am sharing my platform with Dr. Bacheva Maslow, who is a reproductive endocrinologist there and a research... And the director of Director research. of research. And um, today we're going to be... T I'm sorry. She is going to be talking about egg freezing and the cycle and as a single girl i am representing i'm representing the single girls but this is not just something for single people and dr massa is going to explain who can do egg freezing and really like demystifying yeah what egg freezing is it's a little bit uncomfortable it was a word that i definitely couldn't say um until you know a year or two ago i think it's complicated it's a vulnerable topic and it's definitely uncomfortable. So um, if any of you have any questions, you can feel free to ask and um, we're going we're gonna to start here. So we're going to start from the basics because I think that so many people would love information. I would love information. The public would love information. So let's start with like, what is an egg? Where does it come from? Let's start from like the uber super basics. You got it. So ninth grade biology. Okay. Women are born with all the eggs we'll ever have, millions of them. They develop inside of us when we are babies inside our mother's wombs. Over time, we lose those eggs and eventually we run out when we go into menopause. Uh, and where we are sort of on that spectrum towards menopause is one aspect of our fertility. Each month, a group of eggs are gonna come to the surface. Uh, and from that group, the brain selects one egg at random to grow and be available for pregnancy. And the rest of the ones that were had come to the surface, they just get discarded. And then new ones come in their place. So and those are gone, gone. anyway. And so that's despite. why we are basically churning through our egg supply all the time. Uh, and so we start off with millions of eggs uh, and eventually we run out. Um, and really we only release several hundred over the course of our lifetime. Wow. Yeah. Who knew that? Okay, so that's just the basic of what is an egg. Now, what happens to eggs as we get older? Because that is something that I definitely didn't understand. I just sure. thought like, super, same quantity, same quality, but I'm handing it over to you. Yeah, so there's two things that happen to women's eggs as we get older. One is, like I said, the number of eggs decline and eventually run out. That in and of itself doesn't really tell us a lot about who's going to be able to get pregnant and when. Because, like I said, each month, one egg gets selected at random to be available for pregnancy. And it doesn't really matter if you have a lot sitting in the wings or not a lot. What ultimately determines if that's going to be a month that somebody's going to be able to get pregnant is the quality of that egg. And what we mean by quality is actually something super simple. It's the number of chromosomes that are in the egg itself. 
So a healthy- Is there like a certain percentage of quality eggs or we don't ever know? Like if somebody has, like you said, millions, is there a certain percentage of quality eggs or we don't know that? So we can, we can make some assumptions about quality based on age that from studies that we've done on embryos created by women as they get older. We can talk about that in a second. But essentially when we're young, we have many good quality eggs. Over time, the, the damage accumulates inside the DNA of the eggs itself and they start to have errors where they have either too many or too few chromosomes and these abnormal eggs tend to just not work. So if that egg that gets selected for that month is an abnormal egg, then that's just a month in which somebody typically won't conceive. And so as we get older, the natural percentage of our eggs that are abnormal goes up. And so the number of months in which an abnormal egg is released goes up. And so naturally over time, when you look at large groups of people, um, as women get older, the number of months that it takes to conceive will go up and the rates of infertility go up as we get older largely as a result of the quality, not the quantity. And quality is very binary. There's either good eggs or bad eggs. So I like to say like an egg is like a raffle ticket. Right. The more eggs you have, the more likely it is that there's at least one good one in there. A colleague of mine likes to um, refer to the ovaries like gumball machine. Oh, I, I heard that, right. Yeah, so that's, yeah. that's a, at, at my office, we like to use that analogy a lot. When yeah, explain young, it to people, yeah. Yeah, so when we're young, we have a gumball machine that has lots of eggs and most of the eggs are good so most of the gumballs are good. So if at random you open up the gumball machine and one comes out. You get the red because, flavor because that's my favorite. Right. So right. You, you, get a good you want one. a red gumball and when you're younger, there's like lots of eggs, you know, lots of gumballs. Most of them are red and there's like a few yellow ones in there. So when you open the gumball machine and one comes out, at random, most likely you're going to get a red one. When somebody's older, what happens is that there are many fewer gumballs overall and more of them are yellow. And some are banged up, you know, when the coloring is chipped and right. no. And like, more of them are yellow. So when you open it up, you're less likely to get the red one. That doesn't mean that the red ones are any worse when we get older. So that's a really important point. The, the good quality egg at 40 is just as good, has the same number of chromosomes as the egg at 30. There's just fewer of them around. That's why women who are in there. So if somebody gets a quality egg at 41, it's the same quality egg at 32? Right. Yeah. If it's but good, you're less likely to get a quality egg at 42 exactly. than you are at 31. Exactly. And that's why babies born to women who are in their late 30s and early 40s, I mean, women in their late 30s and early 40s can and do have babies all the time, right? Yeah. And there's nothing inherently different about their babies than babies who are born to women in their 30s. It's just sometimes harder and more challenging. I mean, women who are in their late 30s and early 40s, often it takes longer to get pregnant. Right. Some of them may need assistance getting pregnant. They have higher rates of miscarriages because sometimes those abnormal eggs actually do fertilize and implant, but the body and you know ends the pregnancy as an early miscarriage. All those things increase as we get older, largely as a result of the quality of eggs. Right. And the quantity is also highly variable based it doesn't matter if you're 30 and you think you're going to get 20 eggs you could be 30 and get two and you could be 30 and get 20 right. so that's, you know yeah. that's also so that's a total you know egg quantity is a completely different aspect of right. egg quality so egg quality really travels with age egg quantity while it's generally tied to age meaning i have more eggs now than i'm going to have a few years from now all of us do right um where we start off is different and it's like height meaning there are some women who are going to grow up to be tall and other <laughs> women that are grow up to short and it has nothing to do with what you did or choices you made. It's really ingrained in It has our nothing biology. to do with all the carbs I ate, you're saying. No. Got it. Okay. No. It's really ingrained in our biology. So there's going to be some women who start off with a lot of eggs. And even though they're losing eggs, they're always going to be at the top end of the curve. And there's going to be some women who start off with fewer eggs. And they're always going to be at the bottom end of the curve. And most of the time, that doesn't tell us so much about who's getting pregnant. It does, however, tell us a lot about when we think about doing egg freezing, you know, how many eggs am I going to get? A lot of that has to do with quantity. Right. How many eggs do I need or do I want? That's really more of a quality question. That gives us like, well, what's the point? Or what's the goal of egg freezing? Right. Why well, that's, that was actually the next question is like, what is, what is the goal of egg freezing right. really? Yeah. So the goal of egg freezing is really to be able to preserve a group of eggs that has a higher proportion of healthy eggs than you might have sometime in the future. Because if you ever- Which means the younger I do it, to break it down for all of you, is that let's get it going. I wish that I did it when I was 30 or 31 or 32 because the greater chances of being a quality egg is greater. Yeah. So the goal here is not so much that everyone should do it. It's really if you ever found yourself needing infertility treatments. And now infertility is a topic we don't talk about that much either, but it's Taboo. much more common than people think. Correct. 
Um, Tremendously common. Right. We yes. estimate that somewhere between one out of every six to one out of every, every eight couples That's huge. experience some form of infertility. Right. So if at some point in the future you experience infertility and require infertility treatment, your chances of success are directly related to the quality or the age of the eggs that are being used. So if somebody is 42 and needs infertility treatments, and may, maybe she doesn't ever need infertility treatments, or maybe it's not her first child, it's second or fourth, or whatever it may be, somebody who's 42 who's doing, who needs infertility treatments but gets to use her 33-year-old egg. Exactly. It's as if she's 33 and her, her chances, chances of success are much higher, nearly triple. Nothing's a guarantee. You could freeze 50 eggs and there's a possibility that none of them work. And you can freeze two and you get lucky. Right. But your chances of success go up. So you're increasing the odds of success. And so that's really what, when I see patients who are coming to me to talk about egg freezing, the goal here is really to be able to increase their chances should they experience infertility later. And that's really what most women want, want to know and want to be able to understand. And that's really what we talk about. So I know that this is a question that I get asked a lot and, and I know it's something that's uncomfortable to pe- for people is really when should women start looking into it? I just feel like everybody feels self-conscious, like I'm too young and I'm too old and you know, it's, it's so hard. So in my mind, the knowledge is good no matter when you get it. Right, right? information the, is power. The information is useful and helpful and I'd rather that everybody make their decision whether to do it or not to do it. An informed consumer. Exactly. Out of a a recognition that I I did my research, I understand where I stand personally, and it's not going to be the same for everyone. Um, And then you make It's almost never the same for everybody. It's never the same. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So you make the decision with that knowledge in hand. So that doesn't matter. You could be 29, you could be 49. Being able to have more information is always useful. Now there are certain thing, advantages you, you have by, by looking into this at a younger age, meaning somebody who's in their early 30s, the chance it, their percentage of healthy eggs is much higher. So even for the women who are young, who have low ovarian reserve and they have low egg count, they may not get as many eggs, but they, there's a better chance that those eggs are gonna be of higher quality. And so there's a higher chance they may be successful should they need those eggs later on. So there's a little bit of flexibility that you have by getting some of this information earlier. Now, for women who are older, there's never, I never say it's too old to get the information because the goal is to be able to say, look, you know, the same way there might be a 32 year old or a 30 year old who has a very low number, there might be a 40 year old who has very high numbers. And by the way, Dr. Maslow was telling me this before that it did happen. Yeah, of course. That there was a 30 year old that had bad numbers and not the best results. And there was a 40 year old who had very good results. So you really, you, you can never know. Obviously, when you're younger, it is better chances. Let's be real. Right. You know, but it's definitely not a guarantee. I don't love saying it, and I'm sure people don't love hearing it, but that's, it is what it is. It, yeah. And, and I, I hate that line, but yeah. Really, <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't feel it's good. True, yeah. But, you know, honestly, it's, it's the reality of biology, and the goal here is not, I mean, we can't change biology. We can't undo, there's no fountain of youth. But the goal here is to be able to be as knowledgeable as possible and take the steps that make sense for each person. And we were talking about this earlier. Everyone who comes into my office to talk about egg freezing, nobody's doing this as plan A. This is not no. like I always plan to freeze my eggs at this age. Like everybody who walks in is coming from a place of vulnerability. And pain, right. From a place of understanding, like this is not where I expected my life to be at this I did time. not sign up for this. Nobody does. No, and my eggs belong in a freezer in my crispy egg, yo. And it's hard, you know, I know that it took a lot for my, for the patients who come to see me to get to my office. Like that is, it is, it is hard. It's even hard, just walking through the office to speak to you. Yeah. It's a hard process to do. And I, and, and I meet, you know, I want to meet people there. Um, and then realize that this is, this is the first step towards really being able to take, take some control over what's happening. And you know, what I like about where I work is that we've developed a, a specialized practice. I'm sorry, we didn't even say where you were. <laughs> uh, like, hello? We're, we're new to this. Like, okay, you want to tell a little bit of where you work? Um, so I work at Extend Fertility in Midtown Manhattan, where we do a lot of egg freezing. So we were the first uh, practice that was focused on women who proactively wanted to freeze their eggs and learn more about the egg freezing process and about fertility in general. 
we've since expanded and I see patients in for infertility in the full gamut, but I still do a lot of my primary focus is on um, women who are interested in their fertility and fertility preservation. And we have a whole process that's really geared and developed around women who freeze their eggs um, or who women who want to know more about it. And so we have, you know, specially trained staff and a specially trained process that really recognize that the woman who's coming to learn more about her fertility and the possibility of freezing her eggs is an inherently different person than a couple or a woman who's coming with infertility who's trying to get pregnant right, right. now. That's a very different experience. It's a very different mentality. Even the way we set up our cycle, everything's different. And so being able to recognize that has really made this a unique experience for me as the clinician, and I think, I hope, for my patients. Um, but it allows us to recognize that the people who are coming in, it's not easy. It's not a, it's not a fun, exciting, nobody, no. nobody loves coming to see me. I mean, um, you're adorable and you're smart and knowledgeable and informative, but it's, it's, Definitely not the first place we would like to be. Right. You know? I talk, I joked on my Instagram page a little while ago that some people, my office likes to call me Doctor Rebound. Oh, because right. I get a lot of women who come to me at you know on the heels of the end of a long term relationship, a divorce, being an Aguna, um, you know, being single. Yeah. Uh, rebound, you know, like a relationship that didn't work out. Right. You know, it's not just for singles. It's, you know, there's so many, you know. There's a like, lot of uncertainty. Exactly. Let's be real. Everything is uncertain. Right. My fireplace is uncertain. You know what I'm saying? Like things. It is lovely though. Yes, thank you. But okay, so let's say I'm just going to speak for the general public because yes. this is something that I get asked a lot. So I am a girl and I want more information. What now? What do I Perfect. do? So. At Extend, we have a process where the first step And is by the way, guys, this is not a promotion for Extend no. or anything like this. It's just I am putting out their information, and Dr. Maslow is so kind enough to be here and share it because we think that it is so important for the public to know. And if babies can be born from us, holla, really. So no <laughs> promo, no anything. Um, I happen to just have met Dr. Klein, and he is wonderful. And now I met Dr. Maslow, and she is wonderful. So you know, you have to do your own research for what works for you. You can go to Extend there amazing you can go to any place that feels comfortable for you so I just want to put it out there and okay so okay. I'm a girl and I want information what do I do so the first step is really to is to look at the the assessment to get a sense of how what's our your egg supply that's a relatively simple test we so you got to look at my egg supply let's talk about me let's say for example so how do how do we do okay. that so uh, and I can't speak for other places and okay like you we're said, speaking for extent right like you said okay. there's a lot of really good places out there yeah. and my goal here is because I really firmly believe that women should be as educated as possible exactly about their own I, I agree and you take that and also I want to take away the stigma and I think this is so important and 2020 we're empowering people that's what we're doing we're giving them knowledge and knowledge is power right. so so I'll tell you about the process at Extend. So the way we work at Extend is someone comes in for what we call a fertility assessment. It's a free of charge. Um, it's an ultrasound and blood work. Oh. The ultrasound is looks at the ovaries themselves, and what we're looking at in particular are something called follicles. These are small. Is little it painful? Circles. So typically, it's an internal ultrasound. Okay. However, that's not comfortable for everyone, especially if they're not painful. Not not painful, but no. for women, let's say who are not active, who are you know that's uncomfortable. We can also potentially do an abdominal ultrasound. We really want to be able to get a good view of the ovaries. Okay. And I like to joke, Chef Hyatt served me chocolate chip cookies, and I joke <laughs> that those are my favorite. I always like to tell my patients that ovaries look like chocolate chip cookies. On Excellent, ultrasound. great. I'm so glad they, to know that. I will never, never I will chocolate. never look at a chocolate chip cookie the same. Exactly. So, they do. They look. They look at chocolate chip cookies. Each of the little chocolate chips are these little black dots that we see on ultrasound. Are called follicles. The follicles are what house each individual immature egg. And like I said, they, there's a group that comes to the surface each month, or really every day. It's very flux. You know, it's all in flux. But a quick snapshot is gonna be able to say, look, is this somebody who's got you know three follicles on their ovaries, or this is somebody who's got thirty follicles on their ovaries, right? A quick snapshot of what do I look, what's what's the possibility? You gotta see what what's going on. Doing? The second thing that we look at is a, is a hormone test that's a little more specific in terms of helping us guide women to know how many eggs they're going to get. It's a hormone called AMH, or anti-mullerian hormone. It's a hormone that's produced by the eggs themselves. So the more eggs you have, the higher that hormone level is. So we in our, in our facility, someone comes in, they get this. It's very quick, 15 minutes in and out, free of charge, ultrasound blood work. Usually within a week, we'll get the results, and then they set up a consultation with a physician. And is there a fee for that? And extend the, the consultation is free. 
Wow. You can also, that assessment can be done at an OBGYN, like a general OBGYN can off, order an ultrasound and an AMH. The problem or the challenge is that these, these test results are sometimes hard to interpret. AMH is not as sort of perfect and um, accurate or as, as we would like it to be. So you really need someone who's comfortable understanding sort of the ins and outs mm -hmm. of AMH testing. But you can have that test assessment done in OBGYN's office. It's going to get covered by insurance. Well, listen, if I, if I, I'm sorry, like I always say, if it's free, it's for me. I'm saying if I'm coming and I don't have to pay for it right, and it's in-house and, and yeah. you're seeing it, I would... Rather yeah, but not every place is going to do the same thing, so you can have that testing done. Right, well, I'm talking about extend. So let's say I'm speaking about, let's say for me, and then I can come in and I can sit down and have a consultation and be like, I don't understand what these numbers are. Can we talk about it? Exactly. So the goal of the consultation, you know, the way we've structured our process is you come in with that information and then the physician can sit down with you and say, okay, you know, basically review a lot of what we just discussed today. You know, now talking about well, obviously each person is different, so everybody's we're giving you a, a snapshot, exactly. so everybody is going to get more than this for you sure. Know, oh, an okay. hour consult and right. so I and said my catered catered to hour. their individuality. Right. So we talk a little bit about the basics, but then I really talk dive into the results, and what the results tell us is really what can we expect from the process now. One of the things I don't think I mentioned earlier is you can't, quality is so important, but we can't test the quality of right. the eggs. Yeah, you did say, right. Only so, later on, right? Only later on. And so when somebody's thinking about freezing eggs, one of the goals is trying to get as many eggs as they can to compensate for the fact that some portion of them are not going to work. Not viable, right? And so what everybody would love to do is have enough kind of stored away that she can feel reasonably comfortable that if she ever needed to rely on those eggs, there'd be at least one baby. And so what I like to do is make sure that every woman who comes to see me has the key pieces of information. You know, based on my numbers, how many eggs do I think is realistic to expect from an egg freezing process? Can I just tell you what I actually don't like about her? I'm just kidding. I do is that she is so honest and truthful. And she was just like, if I think that it's maybe not, I, she's honest and she tells people straight, really, really, you know, she's just not looking to get business. We were just talking about other people's scenarios and, you know, I, we were just talking about it and she is so honest and straightforward. It was, I was like mind blown because yeah, just want to put it out there. Really? No, I, I, I like that about you. You're not in the, in the selling business. You're not, you know, you were more in the informative business and, right. you know, and I love that. Look, my goal is that my hope is that if this, if this is the right fit for you, you're going to do it because you it's the right thing for you to do and the only way for people to make that decision is to have all the information they need. So I want everyone to walk out of my consultation or any of my colleagues walk out with how many eggs is going to be a realistic expectation for me because some people are going to be able to produce 15, 20, 30 eggs, whatever it may be, and others are not. They're going to be able to only produce two or three or five based on their individual biology. So that's number one. No number failed two. expectations. Number two is based on my age, what are the chances of success with the eggs that I freeze, right? Because, you know, 10 eggs at 32 is going to be an 80 to 90% chance of at least one baby. 10 eggs at 42 is going to be a 10 to 15% chance of at least one baby. And so to be able to say, okay, this is how many eggs I'm going to get out of one egg freezing cycle. These are my chances of success. You know, and then obviously we're going to talk about cost at some point. And then you have all the information you need to say, does this make sense for me? If so, should I think about doing multiple cycles? Is that even possible? And I love that you walk through it with people and not so much as a as a selling, really in an honest, what is best for your right. patient. And I, I, and I, I love I, that. Really, I do. I do. I, no, I have I, so much it, admiration for it's that. It's really important to me that that's, that that's the messaging because I think it, everything gets such a bad rap in the, in the media. You know, there's a lot of discussion, you know, if, this paternalism, this, these scary old men who are trying to, you know, scare women into doing something that's not good for them. Or not doing it. It's really, you know, this is, this is 2020. This yes. is the opportunity for women to really learn about the biology. So much of, I'm, and I include myself in this, you know, there's a generation of women who have grown up feeling like they are able to accomplish so much in their lives and, you know, to be moms one day, to have careers, to have goals in life, and yet we haven't educated our women to have the tools to understand, like, what are the limitations of biology? Like, I can't change it. Right. I, I know when I was looking into it, and I'm like, I don't know who to call. I don't know any information. What does one do? And and, and it's, it's so amazing that we are putting this out there for the world and for people to be empowered. Yeah. Really. Um, 
So those, to me, those, those three things are the important things to walk out of a consultation is how many eggs am I gonna get out of one cycle? What are my chances of success with those number of eggs? And then the cost. Those, the cost is obviously gonna be different no matter where you go. Right. But that's an important thing to know up front. You know, get, is there, get a and, I, I, and, and we don't have to discuss if you don't want, is there like a baseline from eight to 20? Like, is there a baseline number that we can put out there or so it's not it's something, be, you know, it's on the website? So I, on our website, we have some payment, you know, we have some uh, pricing information on our website. We try to be very transparent about pricing. I would encourage you, no matter where you go, to make sure you walk out of your consultation with it. So you know, you know, if you're paying fifteen thousand dollars, you know, if you're paying ten, you know, like other fees associated with also it. Also, the medications also. are expensive. You want to know then, what so, all of the fees that exactly. are going to medications. At least we can never give you an exact number. Wait, well, we'll get to that in the next in my next question, which is uh, like. Okay, so come in, I, you know, do the blood work and, and no, and, and yeah. this, that for free. And then I have a consultation for free and now I have the knowledge. Yeah. Okay, so I have all this knowledge. Now, if I decide to go ahead with it, what does that process look for me? What's next? Okay. What am I expecting? What's next? Perfect. So once someone decides they want to do this process, the next step is we schedule something called logistics or a class where they learn how to do the medications and we set up everything for the cycle. So we have everything all set up, the, you know, the paperwork, everything's done in advance. Um, and so then we typically start with the beginning of the cycle. We have someone call us and say, okay, my cycle began and they come in for a blood work and ultrasound. So this way we have everything, we have everybody set. And this way, if you're talking a little bit early or a little bit late, that doesn't really matter. And we're going to individualize it. When we talk about it in the consultation, we know that everybody's different. It's individualized to whoever's coming yeah. in. Once that, you, that gets started, we have to come in for a blood work and ultrasound, make sure everything looks good and ready to go. Most of the time it does. And we have to start medications that evening. The medications are hormonal injections that we teach our patients how to self-administer. Now, lots of people are yes, very it's a shot. Yes, overwhelmed by this. But I will say the vast majority of women are able to give them medications to themselves. Um, you know, a handful, a small percentage will get someone. I'm going to say that you. it's definitely intimidating to think about it. It is a baby, and I'm the baby of all babies. It is a baby shot. It yes. it, it 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 is. A These little. are really, really tiny needles, um, and they, you know, there's pens, and we teach our patients how to do it so that they feel comfortable um, moving forward. The medications, uh, you take the medications in the way typically is about eight to twelve days, um, and the medications themselves are actually the very same hormones that the brain uses to regulate the menstrual cycle. Is it only a shot that people are taking? It a, a, typically it's it's like a cocktail of injections. Right. Um, the ovaries will respond the way they're naturally supposed to respond to these medication to these hormones, which is that they grow those follicles. Remember, naturally the body is only going to select one follicle to grow. What we try to do is get as many of those available follicles to grow and mature their eggs as possible. Now, you could have two women who look identical at the beginning of their cycle, and we give them the same medications, and they do different things because everybody's different and we respond differently. And so the goal is to have women come in several times throughout their cycle in order to monitor their response and then adjust and individualize the protocols that we're really maximizing, maximizing the how outcome. many eggs each woman's going to get for her cycle. So it's really is not cookie cutter. Um, once it looks like we've grown as many eggs, she's grown as many eggs as we think she's going to be able to. We remove those eggs from her body in a very minor procedure called an egg retrieval. Do I know when that date is going to be? So the egg retrieval is set 36 hours before the retrieval. So you don't know exactly. We can we sort of estimate as we go along, but we're really waiting for that time where we think that we've gotten to the kind of perfect balance of growing as many eggs as possible. We have our patients take something called a trigger shot, which sounds really scary, but it's not. It's just another shot. It's just yeah, another name just for a shot. Scary right. name. But what it does is actually trigger the maturity process for the eggs. And maturity is an important piece for the eggs to be fertilized one day. So we give the trigger shot, and then 36 hours we do the retrieval. So let's say today is let's say on Thursday morning. If we had retrievals Thursday morning, the women who came in for a retrieval Thursday morning took their trigger shot Tuesday night. So that's how we, we set By up. By the way, they explain to you literally the day, the hour, the time, when you should be there. It's not like, come in in an hour. Right. It um, sounds like that almost, you know? Yeah. And it's, you know, I don't negate the fact that it's an intimidating process. It's definitely a process. It's a little bit disruptive to the day-to-day -day life. It shouldn't totally upend your world, right? You should be able to be it's able all, it's to... It's two weeks. It's yeah. not, you know, um, six months. 
Okay, so the procedure itself is very minor. It's done in an outpatient procedure suite. We have one in our office. Um, How long does the procedure generally take? The procedure take? takes between 10 and 20 minutes, depending And do they put you out? Like Yeah, so we it's done under anesthesia. It's the same kind of anesthesia as someone might have for a colonoscopy or an endoscopy or wisdom teeth. You know, this is IV sedation. You're completely unaware of what's going on. You're not hooked up to machines. You're breathing on your own. Um, the procedure itself is done with an internal ultrasound and a needle. Um, through the wall and they're through the vaginal wall and there's no it's there's no stitches there's no incisions so the recovery time is literally like the next day you yeah can... so we have you know, our patients will hang out for 30 45 minutes to make sure the anesthesia wears off i have and this is it everybody's different i have some patients who are like ready to bounce snap them out they're like what's I for wanna, lunch yeah they want to know what's for lunch they want to go to the gym that evening they're like ready to go and then i have other patients that it takes two three four days for them to really feel back to their normal self Everybody's different. I'd say generally most people feel like they could go back to their regular lives the next day. Uh, you know, there might be some cramping. It really shouldn't be anything that can't be managed with like Motrin or Tylenol for the vast majority of women. Uh, once the eggs are retrieved, we they incubate in the laboratory for a little while. We allow them to mature. Again, maturity is actually is very different than quality. It's something we can see under the microscope of the eggs. So you know how many, do you know, you, you know the quantity, but you can't tell the quality. Right. Like, so you, can you tell me how many are getting frozen? Let's say right. you take out 10. Right. Will you so necessarily not, freeze all of those 10? Exactly. Not necessarily. So we, there, everybody, every place does it a little bit differently. We only freeze the mature eggs because right now those are the only eggs that can be fertilized. And we want people to really have a accurate understanding of what they have frozen um, and so we will allow the eggs to mature for a little while in the laboratory. Then the frozen, the mature eggs will get frozen and we call our patients the next morning and let them know how many were frozen. The eggs can remain frozen indefinitely. They are frozen in liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees centigrade. Wow. It's very cold. At that, how long is, I know it's a, how long is the longest that an egg has been frozen and then you have used it or yeah, fertilized so it? Yeah, so the longest like, that an egg has been frozen and then used for a healthy baby, not at our facility, but is 14 years. Oh my God. Uh, and it's, there's no reason it couldn't necessarily be longer. Uh, so once the eggs are frozen, there's literally no metabolic or cellular activity. So when the eggs get thawed, it is, they are no different than they were the day they were frozen, which is the whole point of all wow. of this. Um, and so they can stay frozen. And if, you know, if somebody gets to the point where they're thinking about, you know, they're ready to use their, their frozen eggs, the eggs get thawed and then they get fertilized. And the remainder of that process is actually the rest of what we typically call IVF, right? They, and you do that also. Exactly. Got it. So they'll get fertilized in the laboratory. They grow out to the embryo stage. And then, you know, then there's various things that happen at the embryo stage and ultimately get put back in the uterus for a pregnancy, hopefully. So... Just give me like a little bullet point of, you know, I'm speaking as a single girl and I think, and I'm representing all the single girls and I think that this is an insurance and I think that, you know, for some people it's empowering, for some people it's tremendously painful, the experience, because like I said, definitely, like we say, definitely not a place, wasn't plan A. No, it, it yeah, definitely exactly. wasn't. But, you know, besides single people, you know, you want to talk about, uh, you know, other people who also consider like egg freezing also, because I think that's also so important, you know? Yeah, I think anytime somebody is looking down the barrel of some kind of delay in their fertility, whether that's because they don't have a partner, whether that's because they have a health concern, whether that's because there's an issue in their relationship. Is there any um, health concern that is so prevalent, like that you see, let's say, like you, we were talking about the cancer before or something, right. you know, you want to just expound on that a, a tiny bit for people right. so, because I want them to know that there is this. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the pa one of the kind of groups of patients that I see reasonably frequently are women who have a new, unfortunately, have a new cancer diagnosis. Uh, many of the cancer treatments are so good at curing cancer, but they often have a cost, and typically that cost is in the form of fertility. Uh, I also see women who, let's say, had cancer when they were younger, when they were teenagers or when they were children, who have regained some of their, their function, but the truth is, is that those women are still at higher risk for infertility and early menopause than the rest of other women their own age. Um, and so anytime somebody's looking at delaying their fertility or some kind of risk to their fertility from a medical perspective, 
And the delay of their fertility doesn't necessarily, it's typically a partner, really. This whole notion. Sometimes of, it's a career. Sometimes it's right, like, but you know, this notion of, of, you know, the person, the only people who freeze their eggs are these, you know, women who don't want to have babies because they're focused on their career. Right. That's, yeah. like that's, a that's total finished. That, that's like a side note that I'm saying because we, yeah. we don't even talk about that. That's, you know. I would say, I mean, there's lots of research that's been done that show right. that. 80% of women who freeze their eggs would love to have a child right now, but they just don't have the partner. Word, sister, exactly, um, yes. And that's true in my in our practice too. Like that that data is corroborated. But Dr. Massa was saying that people have come in who are divorced. People who yeah. are divorced with children and right. want to have more children. People who don't have their get. And I was speaking to a woman about a year ago and, I, and she was like, well, my husband is holding this over me. I'm like, go sister, you go get you, you do you, you know? Yeah. So there's so many scenarios. It's not just being single, partner, no partner, having a partner and not wanting right. to have a child, have, not, you know? you know? You know, I've seen patients who are, you know, being deployed in the army and they're going to be, you know, or their partners, their husbands going somewhere and they can be out of the country for a long period of time, whatever it may be. Anytime there's going to be some kind of delay or some kind of um, concern about fertility, that's a perfect opportunity to at least look into it. And you know the options are available. Is it for everyone? It's definitely not. Right. Uh, but being able to understand and move forward out of a place of knowledge, rather than letting the situation it's very empowering. Right. Rather than letting the situation move you, you get to sort of move. You own that. it. Yeah. Exactly. What is the youngest? I'm going to speak for single because that's what I am. What is the youngest single patient that came in by choice and said? Occasionally, I see women in their like mid to late 20s. It's not as frequent. I'd say most of the women that I see are in their early And you think that's a good idea? 30s. So a girl's 28 and she's like, I want to, you know. Look, again, there's never a bad time to get the right. knowledge. If you walk out of that consultation saying, great, I feel good about where my fertility is. This is not the right thing for me to do right now. And I'll come back. Or, oh my God, my, my numbers are so low. I would never have known. Right. Or my numbers are great and I want to do this now. Look, you'd always love to do something before there's a problem, right? Oh, yeah. That's the whole point is to do it before there's a problem. So, you know, if somebody's super motivated and it makes sense for them, great. My, again, my not, my goal is not to have a hundred percent conversion rate. If a hundred percent of the patients who walked into my door did it, then I'm doing something wrong. It, it, does, it doesn't work to, like that. The goal right. is to be able to give everyone that information. And if a 28 year old feels like it's the right thing for her, it's not my place to tell you that it's too young. You know, the same way if there's, you know, a 43 year old woman who thinks it's the right thing for her to do, it's not really my place to tell you it's too old. It's really understanding what are my chances? What, what am I going to get out of it? Where's the value? Making a decision, me? like you say, and we say it all the time based out of knowledge, and understanding and with information. No, I, I think that is so important. That's really what we're here is to take away its stigma, to spread a message, to show the importance, to say, you know, women, you can take control of your life. You know, man, no man. It's just, there's yeah. so much information and there's so many amazing people who have this information and what was available, I don't even think this information, Dr. Massa was, pub is, what is it, publishing? Like, oh no, really, yeah. all of these informations because there is no information out there and that's what's mind boggling to me. You know, like yeah. it, it, it's, 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 it's phenomenal. I know I was saying there's so much that science has discovered and done about the diagnosis and treatment of infertility over the last 30 years, right? The first IVF baby just turned 40, right? So IVF wow. didn't exist two generations ago. We, I have 8 million babies have been born worldwide from IVF. So those are families that have grown in ways that in previous generations never would have existed, right? There's so much that we can do. And yet the basic knowledge... I'm just going to take some credit for some babies out there. So if you want to name your babies Chaya, we will take that credit. Okay, <laughs> moving on. But the basic knowledge of, you know, why do some women have infertility and others don't. Right. Why do some women lose their eggs earlier than others? Why are some the AMH super low? Like it doesn't, yeah. it's not an eight. It's, it's it we, is. There's so much about just natural biology that we don't know yet. And that isn't being studied because up until now. Everybody, you can say that you knew her back before she was famous publishing all of that stuff because I'm just going to tell you, you saw her here first. Well, maybe not, but um, yeah. All right, so any last, we're going to go through a couple of questions, yeah, but please. like, you know, because I'm going to scroll up, I just wanted to pay attention and, and process and listen, but anything else that we didn't cover or you would like to share and that you feel like that comes up all the time or, you know, anything, any I last think thoughts? It's so, it's so um, prevalent that women feel like they're the only one. 
that they feel like I'm the only one that's thinking about this. I must be crazy or nobody else is worried about this or I'm the, you know, I'm the only one with X, Y, Z. And it's just not true. Like we all have stuff. And I think how many people are watching this? You can, there's lots now of 200, people. Yeah. yeah. There's lots of people out there who are struggling with similar things. And if this is a, a concern of yours, the knowledge and the understanding and taking the time to, to own that concern and treat that concern is worthwhile for everyone. And so, like I was saying, like the only thing in life you regret are the chances that you didn't take. So even just gaining the knowledge, even coming in, even knowing what this information is, is empowering. Is yeah. And look, are you going to feel, is everyone going to feel amazing after they do their cycle? No. no. I think there are, you know, I definitely have some patients who walk out and were like, even if I never use those eggs, that was the best experience. I feel like I took control of my situation. I feel like I did something for me. I did something that was really meaningful. And I have plenty of other patients who are like, I still feel crummy. Like my life is still not where I wanted it to be. Right. And I did all this and I still am here. And I think all of that is normal. And it's all They're all fun. valid. Yeah. I, I think that everybody's feelings are valid. And we were talking about it before. We empathize with them all. And I look at it as insurance. I look at it as in, you know, hopefully I'm going to get married and I'm going to have kids in a minute, but I want to know that I did whatever I could do and it's, it's insurance and insurance right. could be empowering. And, you know, maybe some people look at it as giving up. It's just really doing what you can do for your life. Right. I definitely don't look at it as giving up. I think I see why people feel that way or why it feels that way to be in that place. But Ultimately, what you're really saying when you when you think about freezing eggs is, look, I have the hope. I have. The I'm gonna have kids, and I, I want to have. have, have a, I want to have a better chance. Right. I have the. I, I I believe that one day I'm gonna have, find a partner, and I'm gonna be able to have a family. And I want to make sure that when that day comes, I'm giving myself the best chance to reach my goals. Right. And whether your goal giving up would really almost money, be like I'm not doing it, right. and maybe I'll find a guy, maybe I won't, and then it's like, okay, you're 41, and it's rough, man. You know, like it's hard. So, okay. I'm going to scroll through. Let's see guys, if you have any questions, shoot them now. I'm just going to scroll up here and see what some people asked. So if you have any, you know, please feel free to ask. Um, okay. Let's see what we have here. Oh, got to find them all. Hi everybody. Thank you so much. A huge believer to freeze eggs in a security. Okay. How old is too old to freeze your eggs? That's a great question. Er. So, at Extend, we'll see patients up until 45 because there have been IVF babies now from women's eggs at 45. Now, there are, whenever I talk to women who are, let's say, 40, older than 42, so 43 and up, I'm very, very, very straightforward about the fact that there's very little data about women who have frozen their eggs after the age of 42 and then gone on to use those eggs for babies. Because, like I said, the, the is that going to be one of your things you're going to publish? <laughs> you never know. Just saying, we'll look, do a collab. I never say never. Because right. You can't ever know for sure. Because um, there's crazy miracles, yeah, like but really, the but still, there are really, the odds. You know, you're, right. You want to be realistic. I'm right. Trying, I'm not trying to sell miracles here, but also really understand. You know, what are the chances of success? The chances of success certainly are much smaller after the age of 42. But in some women, it still makes sense. So that's where there's really isn't. A, a definitive line. Um, but you see until 45. We will see and have consultations until 45. They're really, after the age of 45, the chances of it working are so low that it's it's really like almost unfair. The chances have. of freezing them, but not the chances of using prior frozen eggs, let's no, say. and that's a great question. We didn't really even yes, address that. Yes, right. That the, the, one of the things, the reason egg freezing exists or one of the ways egg freezing was sort of developed is that there's this, there's been a, a trend to, there's been a process called using donor eggs, meaning women who have gone to an age, whatever that age may be, where they can no longer get pregnant with their own eggs. And to be honest, we're all going to get to that. Is age there, age. is there a certain ish, a, you know, or Look, no, it's always, gonna, it's, it's different for everybody eventually. Some right. Some, in some women that's in their thirties and in some women that's in their late forties, but whatever it may be, there's a, there's a, we are all going to get there at some point. Now women who get to that point where they can no longer get pregnant with their own eggs, but still want to carry a child in up until now, what they, the option that's been available to them is to use donated eggs. Meaning they take eggs from a younger women, usually women in their twenties, um, 
and you can then fertilize them and carry them in pregnancy, you know, in an older woman who no longer, even a woman who's already hit menopause, where she doesn't get cycles anymore. Really? Yeah, the uterus itself will respond to the hormones. So we can give hormones to a woman and she can carry a pregnancy, even long, her, her ovaries can be gone. Um, that doesn't mean that it's a good idea. Okay. okay. Right? So like not every 49 year old woman is going to be healthy enough to carry a pregnancy, but it, it can be done. So again, not just because it can be done doesn't mean it should be done. Correct. Right. That's a discussion to have at that point. Anyways. So we've known that that mechanism exists. So in, in an ideal world, freezing your eggs at a young age allows you to essentially one day Prolong. become your own egg donor. Correct. Right? If you ever get to the point where you needed to rely upon an egg donor, instead of relying upon someone who's genetically different than you, you could rely upon your own eggs. In a perfect world, that's what it would be. Right. Um, but that wasn't your question. Because I need someone to have my carb-eating genes. But um, what, what was, was my question? question? I think... At the, up to what age, but let's okay. say even 45, but then let's say you can utilize those frozen eggs right. until... So at there, there's no... there In theory, there's no limit, right. but it really depends Again, on the health... Of, of your body, the of, okay, exactly. right. Can you ask, up until what age can you place fertilized egg? So that's what I... That's basically right. what you just said. Um, okay, let's see. <laughs> Halachically, is it allowed? So... I'm not going to speak, I'm obviously not like a halachic. Everybody has to ask their authority. local Orthodox rabbi, I right. always say I'm that. I'm not a halachic authority, but obviously I work very, very closely with many of the, like many rabbanim and halachic organizations, and generally many are very supportive of it. I work very closely with many rabbanim who are very supportive too. So there are, you know, it's a conversation to be had, but I would say generally the trend has been in favor and supportive of it the same way. Generally, the trend is very support. You know, the halacha is very supportive of of couples utilizing IVF in order to have pregnancy. You know, because look, Peru is the first mitzvah. Right. right. We, the in our communities, it's so important to be able to protect the opportunity to have a family, and so generally, that's it. The the halachic aspects don't have to be. You don't have to be too afraid. Meaning, I see women who are like, I'm not even going to consider it because like, obviously it's halachically not appropriate. I think it's worth the question. It's also, there's so many um, Jewish organizations that are so involved in this now. I mean, there has to be a reason for it. Right. Again, and I'm not a rabbi. Part of, my, part of my whole passion in life is to be able to engage our community in discussing these issues, right? The more we discuss, you know, how does Allah think about this issue or that complicated issue, even if we don't come to an answer, the more we engage in it, the more we demystify it. That's right. Say, That's what we're doing right now. This is a great question. If you freeze your eggs, does it make you less fertile naturally? Like it. it takes your good, it takes your good eggs, so less likely to naturally get pregnant. We discussed okay. this we before. Just, this blew, okay, I blew your mind. Exactly. Okay, so do you remember I told you that? Yes, the, I'll save this the life. Follicles come up to the surface every month. So there's a group that comes up. That group, if the you know one's going to get selected, the remainder of those follicles they'll reach a certain point in their lifespan. If they have not gotten selected for ovulation, they just die out and then new ones come and so every month even every day we're losing we're shedding all these so that month you just happen to be grabbing it otherwise it's going in the garbage yeah. per se so essentially what we do when we do egg freezing is we try to grow and capture and preserve these group of eggs that otherwise would have been lost and so women who do this process they don't go into menopause earlier so if i freeze 12 eggs you're not going to lose one year of your fertility life and it doesn't affect their future fertility in any way there's really good data to support that I love it. Um, what age does it need to start being done to catch good ones? We spoke about that before. I'm going to save the live. Would you recommend someone with PCOS freeze their eggs? So PCOS is a really interesting question. PCOS, so for people who don't know, PCOS stands for polycystic ovarian syndrome. We could spend a lot of people a lot of I know time. have that. I didn't know what it was because I was getting so a lot PCOS, of messages about that. PCOS is the most common endocrine or reproductive disorder of young women. It's super common. Right. It happens to also be more common in Ashkenazi Jewish women. Um, it's very, very common. Interestingly, the reason PCOS sometimes leads to infertility does not necessarily have to do with the number of eggs in the ovaries per se, but has to do with the communication between the brain and the ovaries. So women with PCOS classically don't get regular cycles because they don't release eggs at a regular interval and so it's hard to get pregnant because you don't know when the right time oh you don't the know egg is going to be got it is going to be released however the reason that happens is usually because there are those women who are born with lots and lots of eggs so they're like at the mm. top end of that curve and the message from the brain to the ovary kind of gets lost amongst all those eggs that are there and that is a problem for women trying to get pregnant sometimes 
Right. And it's, it can be treated with medication. There's, that's a whole nother... A whole nother whole gamut. Nother Come in for a consultation. Yeah. Now but I work for you. Thank for you. For freezing, it actually is almost a good thing because typically the women who are getting that, you know, when you hear stories of somebody who froze like 30 eggs, usually, not always, but sometimes it's those women who have PCOS because they tend to have so they many have so available, many. Got it. we're able to freeze more. So it's, it's almost like a... All right. Um, I know it's such a hard, it'll be, you know, number 47 of your study, but how many babies have been born from frozen eggs is... Yeah, so there haven't been nearly as many as have been born from IVF. The way we're talking about egg freezing, you know, the, about women choosing to freeze their eggs has really only been around and available for like the last six pretty, years. Pretty recent, right. So women who freeze their eggs mostly want to freeze them for somewhere between five and seven years. And so we're really just getting the first wave of women who are starting to use their first Even though you were saying that the first baby was, let's say, 40, right, so you know? it's been done. Yeah, but well, not as... But it used to be considered experimental. Right, not, it not... It was only done for women with cancer. There's, to be open to the public, the way we're discussing it today hasn't been around for that long. So right. We're, we estimate that there's probably somewhere between, you know, in the tens of thousands of babies. Not okay. millions of babies, but the studies that have looked, you know, that are out there really don't see difference. You know, don't see that there's like a difference between women who froze their eggs and had babies that way than women who did IVF and used fresh eggs that weren't frozen. Or women who had naturally. Right. Like, there's really no. Um, also, does endometriosis? Um, did I say it right? Endometriosis. Endom- right. I did. Okay, affect the number of eggs someone has. So that's it's variable. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay. Um, do it, do it, do it. Should someone with PCOS or endometriosis freeze right. their eggs? Okay. Is, good question, Chaya, is any of the process covered by insurance? So this is a great question. Great question. And starting January 1st, 2020. What? In New York State. Yesterday? Yesterday. Word. New York State um, started a new fertility mandate. Now, how this is going to play out, we'll see. We have to wait. Um, but generally, you know, People who work for corporations that have private insurance that have more than 100 employees and yada, 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 there's going to be some state mandated insurance for infertility. Now, what that means for fertility preservation is a little unclear. Certainly, if there's a medical reason for infertility, right, I was just going to say exactly that's covered or not if it's just a choice. So, how it gets played out in terms of sometimes the medications are covered, some and now more and more insurance companies are covering it. It's so more and more Elec- elective egg freezing. More and more corporations are using it as a benefit. So like if you work for a corporation, they may. They I gotta get a job, a sister. Benefit. Yes. Um, women who work for the Department of Ed, the New York State. Department oh, why did I give up Ed, my job? Yeah. Um, sometimes those medications are covered. So there, I would say it's much more. So we got to wait a little for that to play out. Okay. So it's always worth looking into. Yeah. Okay. What is the cost? It, we discussed this before. You can check on the website. Also, you can come in for a complimentary consultation and they can discuss it because I think for each person, it really... Yeah. It's going it, to vary for person. It's going to vary where you go. It's, you know, it's... Every clinic or... Be it is is, is definitely different. Um, I'm definitely going to save the live. So many of people asking, do you have a lot of Jewish Orthodox women using donor eggs? Great question. That's a great question. I don't know why I would say a lot. Uh, but I think there's going to be me. more because there are so many single, older women. Yeah, I mean, like, it I is, think these are, this is and I don't like the word I, older single, but yeah. This is part of the idea of engaging the community, meaning these are issues that are that people are thinking about, that are talking about, let, you know, talking about what does it mean to use, you know, if you're an Orthodox person and you're using a donor egg, does that affect you know, is it better to use a Jewish donor egg or a not Jewish donor egg? What makes sense? Those are, these are complicated questions. I give like lecture, I get invited to different like communities and sh- and shows to give lectures on this topic. It's really fascinating and something I'm excited about, but it's, it's worth, it's in, you know, it's worth a discussion and it's, it's complicated, but cool. Um, and I will say it's not something that's like across the board, not allowed, which people are very surprised about. Right. Which, which is very surprising. You but know? it's a conversation, yeah. I think everything is a conversation. I think that either they can come in and get the information from you and then go to their, you know, whoever they're comfortable with, their local Orthodox rabbi, speak at the organizations, or, you know, how old is too old to freeze your eggs? We spoke about that. And again, you know, we are not God, you know. Um, does thawing an egg have an effect of a quality of egg? So, you know. So that's a great question. In theory, in a perfect world, if you the egg it should be the same exact as it was before you froze it now 
Egg freezing and thawing is a technically challenging thing to do. Not everybody can do it. Like you have to really have specialized right. technique and specialized training. I can imagine. And so there, you know, you have to go somewhere where they are very good at freezing eggs and they're very comfortable freezing and thawing eggs. So in years past, and the reason it was still experimental and not as popular is that the older technology and the older techniques were much more damaging to the egg. The newer technology, which is called vitrification, um, the newer technology should have a much lower rate of damage to the eggs, if at all. So generally in a place like ours where we're really comfortable and have a lot of experience, that's not really a concern. But out in the public, that should be a concern. That's something you should, wherever you go, you should ask them about their thawing rates and how comfortable they are thawing eggs. Are there a lot of eggs that are lost in the thawing process, et cetera. It's like an expertise, basically. It is, it is, it's like a highly technical expertise. I know. Somebody was a little bit like... Ha, you know about the egg the age of egg freezing and how they think that we're encouraging people at the age of 45 so she's asking again what is the ideal age to freeze yeah. which is you know if you so, want us to be a little bit more specific you know yeah, i would say there really is no ideal and i know that's right. a very annoying answer but, but the true. younger so i usually i like to tell people you know the golden age to do this is somewhere between 31 and 34 is a nice age to do this. Does that mean that women who are under 31, it shouldn't do it, or women who are older than 34 shouldn't do it? Absolutely not. And that's why the because knowledge is so critical because every right. person is individual. Every person's numbers are different. That's why it's she's not misinforming at all nope, no. because she doesn't want to deter somebody who has hopes and dreams at 40 who's only learning this information, right. you know, um, at all. Um, but definitely, you know, and this is, I was just saying that this is a study that I'm working on that's hopefully getting published shortly. Um, women who do this process at a younger age, let's say less than under 35, tend to need fewer cycles. So it's less expensive that way. Right. They need, tend to use less medication. So it's less expensive that way. The, the whole process is more efficient when you do it younger. The thing is, the younger... And also later on, it's also right. cheaper because you don't have to keep doing right. IVF cycles, the only, you know? The downside is the younger you do it, the less likely it is you'll ever need those eggs. So if you're concerned about the fact that you put in, you know, you made the eggs and you put you put in the cost and you don't need them, that's the balance you have to take. What's the likelihood I'm going to need them versus, you know, if you knew, if I could look into a crystal ball and tell you 100% you're going to need your eggs and it's a no-brainer, you should do it. And that if it was, was free, every like we discussed yeah. it before, like everybody would be doing it. I, we understand that it is costly and it is painful. And for all the people who are even dreaming about it, doing some people can't even come across the threshold because it is so painful. Yeah. You know, like they just, you know, I meet people in the street who, you know, who come over to me like, I wish I had the courage to talk about it, to think about it, to even do it. It is a courageous thing, even coming in, yeah. you know, just, just to do something like that. Um, so, oh, I think we have like one or two more minutes because we started the live. But um, if someone has a child older, is it more likely for the child to be born with a disability? And how does the egg freezing affect that? So, look, disability is a like a broad Right, term. it's so, it's so, so broad, meaning you can have somebody that, at 25 who has a child with a disability also. Right. So there are some things that are associated with age. So we know that things like Down syndrome, for example, is the classic example that Down syndrome rates increase as when we get older because Down syndrome is an extra chromosome 21. And like I said, the, the, the errors in the chromosomes in the eggs We have a minute and a half remaining, so. Okay, happen as when we get older. But the only way egg freezing affects that is that you're using younger eggs. There isn't a way necessarily to test the eggs right at the egg stage, like we said. And there's always a chance of some, you know, we can't, we can't at this point develop perfect babies in whatever that may mean in the right. laboratory. So there's always a chance of something, nothing's ever going to be a guarantee. Nothing in life is a guarantee, you know, but... Um, guys, we are hopefully going to do this again. If you have any questions, you can DM Dr. Maslow. I'm going to tag her again in the stories. She's in my stories. And I just think that this is so important either for yourself or to share it with a sister or an aunt or a niece or a cousin. And I know people are so afraid to talk to their loved ones about it because it's so taboo and it's so uncomfortable. And I know when people speak to me about it, I don't, I don't love it, you know, but it's coming from a place of love and everything is in, is in the delivery really. Yeah. And is just, is this information. And, um, um, so, you know, Dr. Massau is from, is now practicing at Extend, which is amazing. And we can tag Extend too. 
yeah, we can tag them also not here. And you can follow Dr. Maslow also on her Instagram where she just speaks about all different things. And it's fascinating. It's interesting. It's inspiring. It's empowering. And just, I ask for you is for you. This is me paying it forward. I'm asking for you to pay this message forward, to share it with people. And you know, that's all, that's all we can do. Thank you. I'm like so wowed by your, you know, we're sharing my platform here. with the world and you know, like, you know, that's all we want is we just want to share information and, and babies being born. And guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm going to save this live. All right. And, and now.